Welcome to Adobe Camera Raw 15. No, I've decided to put out a new video on Adobe Camera Raw because we've had some major updates. And the way the program works is quite a bit different than the way it used to work. I've decided to completely redo my Adobe Camera Raw video. This video is gonna go over from A to Z. And because I'm making such a comprehensive video, I am going to add timestamps to this to make it easier if you do need to go back through and find a specific element that you're looking for. So this is Adobe Camera Raw. And first of all, what in the world is Adobe Camera Raw? So Raw or Adobe Camera Raw is a raw converter. If you shoot a raw photo, and sometimes this can be a little bit confusing to people, there's two different terminologies used for raw. One is that it's your unedited image. And that could be a JPEG, a TIFF, an actual raw file like a CR2, a NEF, a DNG. That has nothing to do with what Adobe Camera Raw is used for. Adobe Camera Raw is specifically for raw file types, meaning .cr2 from Canon, .cr3 from Canon, NEF files from Nikon, the Sony files, which are ARW, I think, and we'll also add in there the DNG files from Adobe. What the raw file converter does is exactly what it says. It converts from raw to something that is usable for Photoshop. By default, Photoshop cannot open a raw file. So what they've done is they've integrated Adobe Camera Raw into Photoshop so the image will automatically open. And you'll see down here, we have an open and this would open the image into Photoshop. Some people are gonna see this and like, well, Photoshop has a lot of this stuff in it, why should I use it? Well, a raw file is just an image capture. Nothing has actually been applied to it. So if you get a JPEG image, it goes through the camera's processor, sharpening, portrait styles, color spaces, a whole bunch of stuff gets applied to the image. A raw file is completely different. Nothing has been applied. All you've done is capture the image. What raw will allow you to do over here on the right hand side, further adjust it before it gets processed, which let me tell you has been the greatest invention in digital photography. Before we didn't have this option and you were kind of stuck with what you want. So if you shoot a JPEG, you're basically stuck with the capture. You can't go back and fix the color balance. So in this image here, the white balance is completely off. So if you shot a JPEG image, and your white balance was off like this, you're, you're kind of stuck with it. Well, with a raw image, you can actually go back in. You can see over here, we've got all the options that are basically under the white balance function on the camera. So you can do them after the fact. And that's really the power of Adobe Camera Raw. You can do a lot to save or control or manipulate your image after the fact, but before it gets into Photoshop. And things like white balance here are far superior in Adobe Camera Raw than they are in Photoshop. This gives us the ability to fix and really get an image looking a whole lot better before it goes into Photoshop. And you will see over the time of this tutorial, I will tell you things that I think are beneficial to do in Raw and things that I think are not beneficial to do in Raw. We are gonna take a look at how to use Adobe Camera Raw 15.0. So I have downloaded a bunch of raw files that anybody can get. They are available on Signature Edits. The problem with Signature Edits is there's no direct link to find these files. So you would actually have to go onto their website and search and look for these exact same images if you wanna do that. That way it would allow you to work along with me. The truth about it is, you don't really need these specific images. Any image that you put into Adobe Camera Raw, as long as it's a raw file, is gonna work.
Now, the first thing that I've done here and might be different is I've actually launched four images into Adobe Camera Raw at once. So I've made a selection and I'll go back here. I use Photo Mechanic, so you can see I've selected all four of these images and I've told them to send it to Adobe Camera Raw or Photoshop in this case. And what this will allow me to do is to work on multiple images. Now I brought this up so you can see what it looks like. Normally I would just have one image here, but this is what we call the film strip look. And if you wanted to hide that, you would just come on over here, click this button and boom, that is gone. If you want it to come back, you click it again and there's the film strip. You can also make the film strip go vertically if that is something you are so inclined to do. You can come in here, you can click, hold, you can come up here, go to vertical and boom, just like that. Now the images are vertical. And what that does is it gives you more space from top to bottom, which is your shortest dimension. This is something I actually prefer. So we'll go ahead and take a look at this just like this. Down here, we're seeing what size our image is. So right now we are viewing this image at 67.5%. Now I could make it at 100%, but it would enlarge the image and I wouldn't get to see it in full view. The next thing that we have over here is this little bar right here and we can click on that. And this allows us to sort the image. We have these images over here. How would we want to sort them? By capture date, by file name, by star rating, by color label. I don't think this feature is useful in Adobe Camera Raw. That's something that I'm using in a browser, whether that's Lightroom, Adobe Bridge, or in what you saw, Photo Mechanic. I usually am not gonna have enough images in Adobe Camera Raw. If you were to try to load like 100 images into Adobe Camera Raw, you'd probably crash your computer. So it's not really that beneficial to sort by any method. So I usually have that at default and don't touch it. Down here is another one. It allows you to filter your images. So if I tagged this image by giving it one star or a color label, it would allow me to filter those images so I could just see this image, which would be my favorite. In this case, if I'm sending an image to Adobe Camera Raw, it's most likely because I wanna work on it. So it doesn't really serve a purpose for me to do that. That's something once again, that I would do in photo mechanic. So you can see these images have been tagged for some reason. And so I could filter those there by turning this off and bam, we just see the red files. That's the process of what it wants to do. Not really beneficial in Adobe Camera Raw because Raw is really for us just to process our images. So let's go ahead and start off with this. The first step, the first thing that you wanna do in Adobe Camera Raw is you wanna come down here and you wanna set this information. I will show you how I have it set, but that does not mean it is what you need to set it at. So we'll click on this. I work in the color space of Adobe 98. Color management is important in photography. If you do not understand it, you might wanna watch a video on color management. The two basic profiles people use are this one, which is Adobe RGB, which used to be called 1998, and sRGB, which is the profile used on the web. If you are working on a PC, most likely your computer is set up for sRGB. However, Adobe RGB is a larger color gamut, so most photographers tend to work in Adobe RGB. There's also something called Photo, which is an extremely large color gamut. It is so large that even if you have a 5K monitor, it can't display all the colors. A printer could never print anywhere close to a Photo image, and the human eye can't even recognize all the colors in Photo. So I tend to not use it because it just is not beneficial. I work in the color space of Adobe RGB. And because nothing has been applied to the image, this is the first step in color management of photography. And what the program will do is when I come over here down in the corner and say open, it's going to apply that color working space to my image. The other one, which is actually probably more important, is to have your image working in 16 bits per channel. In photography, we have the option, as you can see here, to work in eight bits 
or 16 bits. Eight bits per channel will give you 256 shades of gray. That's a simple way to understand it. 16 bits of color does not give you 512. It gives you about 64,500. Simple way to think about it. A whole lot more data, an extreme amount more of data. However, no cameras shoot in 16 bit. Most cameras are in 12 and 14 bit. However, Photoshop only works in eight and 16. So to give yourself the largest color gamut, we work here in Adobe, working in 16 bits per channel over here versus eight bits gives us a whole lot more information to move around and make adjustments with. So we're gonna start there. The last one is resolution. Now by default, most printers work at 300 pixels per inch. So I set mine at 300 pixels per inch. I think the default is 240, but I like 300 so I can keep it there. Whether you have it at 300 or 240 will have absolutely no impact on your image. Once you're done with that, you can just go out here and hit okay and boom, we are out of it. The last thing is the, are these little stars that you see right here. So this would allow us to give an image a star, like we love this image, so we'll give it five stars. And remember over here, we could filter by star rating, so I could say anything with a star, I just wanna see that, and it shows me that image. Look, this isn't something I think is beneficial, like I said before. So let's go ahead and go to star rating, and we're gonna put no rating, and we have all our images back up. That's what the little stars are for. We can delete the stars if we want. I personally don't think it's beneficial in Adobe Camera Raw to use. The next thing we're gonna come over here is this, and this is the important side of Adobe Camera Raw. Now I've brought this image in of this woman very specifically, I've used it before. I always use it and it's because the white balance is off. It's really cyan and blue. It does not look good. Now there's no reason you couldn't use this white balance in an image because you want it to have a specific look, but to be natural and normal looking, it's off. So this is gonna show us the very first thing and the most important thing you should do to every single image in Adobe Camera Raw. Why? Because this is far better in Adobe Camera Raw than in Photoshop. You can more easily and more accurately color correct an image in Raw than you can in Photoshop. That does not mean that you might need to tweak it in Adobe Photoshop, but, this is a really simple thing to do and it's gonna be more accurate. Right up here, we're gonna skip over this for right now. We're gonna go right into the white balance and they'll come back up here to tell you what that is. So under the basic panel, and if it's not open, you would click this little arrow and boom, just like that, it opens up. We have the word white balance, camera's white balance. By default, it comes in as shot. We click on the little arrow and we drop down, we have auto, daylight, cloudy, shade, extend, fluorescent, flash, and custom. Most of these are what we call presets. And these are preset to a specific Kelvin temperature. The way white balance works in photography is measured in Kelvin. The higher the number, the bluer the image. The lower the number, the warmer the image. Now, these settings are gonna work opposite because they're correcting for the issue. By default, we come, it comes up as shot. Now, if we go to auto and we select that, it's automatically going to guess at what it thinks is the perfect color balance. Sometimes auto tends to be a little bit warm. In this case, I think it did a really awesome job of getting that exact at what it should be. You can see right here, it's got a color temperature of 7,500. And what it's doing is it's correcting that Kelvin temperature, which is 7,500. Remember, I said the higher the number, the bluer it is. The average or normal white balance for an image is 6,500 Kelvin. 
and some people will consider it 5,500 Kelvin. That's on the warmer side. Natural, normal daylight is 6,500 Kelvin. 7,500 Kelvin would be bluish, and this is what this slider is correcting for bluish. So it, what it's doing is it's sliding over to the yellow. So if we went to back to 6,500, you would see it's looking too blue. So that's what it's correcting for. Remember, it's working the opposite. Now, we can come down here and go to daylight, but this isn't daylight, it's shade. So that Kelvin preset isn't gonna work. Maybe if we go to cloudy, that's gonna be better. And yes, that looks better. Let's try shade, because this is in kind of cloudy, kind of shade. And you can see that's pretty good, maybe a little bit warm. Tungsten, gonna look really bad, because tungsten would be your old incandescent light bulb, which really aren't available anymore a fluorescent setting, a flash setting, which would be set at 5,500 Kelvin, and custom. Now, custom can come about in two different ways. One, you could do a preset, so I could do shade, and that's gonna be the preset right here of shade. But down here, we have temperature and tint. These are ways to further adjust color temperature on an image. So as soon as I slide either this slider or this slider, the white balance will change to custom because I have changed it from the preset. So in this case, if I think the image is a little bit too red and I cool it off, it's gonna go to custom. Or if I slide this to green, it's gonna go on custom. Well, why? Because I'm making a custom white balance, not a preset. Over here, we have a little droplet. And you can see here, it says it wants us to pick a neutral color. Well, it just so happens that the background is sort of a neutral color. So we can click on that. And what it would do is try to white balance off what it thinks is the normal or neutral color is. And just like normal, it almost never works. So this is something that I very, very rarely ever use. If you were under perfect lighting circumstances, and had a perfectly neutral background, like in a studio setting, this might actually work. But in this case, I think by default, using the methods over there are easier. In this case, I'm just gonna go up to auto. That was actually the most accurate. It's kind of cool, it's warmed her up a little bit. If I wanted to tweak it a little bit and warm it up a little more, I can take this slider and maybe go to the right a little bit to warm it up. But this is gonna be pretty accurate as far as it goes, and that is white balance under the basic panel. The most important and first thing that you should do to every single image, even if it doesn't change anything, do it, try it, see what looks the best. Up here, we have the histogram. And all the histogram does is tell you where the data is in your image. Now this can be beneficial if you understand how to read a histogram, but most people watching this video probably have no idea in the world how to read a histogram. So we can see right here, over on the right-hand side are your highlights, and on the left-hand side are your shadows. And this is basically your mid-tone areas. So if you look here, there's not a lot of data in the highlights. Well, look, there's no bright highlights except for right up in here on this image. There's a lot of mid-tone areas and there's a little bit of black. But we see this little spike of black there. It's showing us where it is. And as we were to come in here and adjust this, this would adjust our histogram. Now we see red, green, and blue because every image that we work on on a computer is seen in red, green, and blue. You should never be working in CMYK on a photo on a computer. You only convert to CMYK, but you never work in CMYK. Now we have two little weird boxes up here and it's right here and right here. So this is our highlight side. If I click on this, you'll see it's adding a little white box. So if I come up here and I click on it again, boom, we've got that little white box. I can come over here, click on that. It's got that little white box. And you can see by doing that, it is a highlight alert. So red is for your highlights. And what it's showing is that 
your whites are clipping, meaning you've completely lost the detail. So if I come over here to my highlights and I slide them to the right to increase them and I start to slide this, now you're starting to see that, yeah, this looks horrible and it's telling me that I've completely lost all the detail in this area. You do not want this to happen. However, in this case, this image being clipped is okay because it's not really in an important area and it's just the nature of the beast. An image can only capture so much. Over here, we have our highlight clipping and this shows up in blue. So if you see there's some little specks of blue in here, and what I'll do is I'll just increase this to make it worse. So you can see now it's saying that you're clipping your blacks, meaning you're making them too dark and they're just gonna be like a solid area. I call this blocking, where basically it's making the area look very two dimensional. I'll turn this off so we can see it, but you can see it looks like a big black space. Well, that doesn't look good. We don't want that. We wanna see detail in our image, so we don't want that to be blocking. This is helpful in the beginning and if you don't have a calibrated monitor. Now, I have a calibrated monitor and I've been doing this for a long time, so I tend to have these turned off because they drive me nuts in the image. I know what I'm doing, so I don't need them. But if you're starting off and you don't wanna clip an image, you can easily turn those on and it will show you either red or blue when you start clipping an image. Let's slide down to right here. You will notice that there's ISO 6400, 50 millimeter, F4, and a shutter speed of one hundredth of a second. And what this is doing is just showing you how this image was photographed. Great information. I use this for students all the time because it tells me if they knew what they were doing or just kind of guessed and have horrible settings. It's one thing to take a picture and have it come out but your settings aren't good, so this allows me to see what they're doing. Next thing that we down, have down here is to edit. And this is just going to use AI to analyze your photo and edit it perfectly according to what it thinks it should look like. So you can click this and boom, it tones the image, all right? It didn't do a bad job for this, but in general, auto doesn't work so great. So I'm gonna hit Command Z to undo that. Down here, the next option we have is black and white. I can click on this and it will turn our image into black and white. So this is actually a good thing because a perfectly toned color image does not translate into a perfectly toned black and white image. So if you know you're gonna to be toning in black and white, it can be beneficial to hit this little button, convert your image to black and white and making adjustments looking at it in black and white versus color because those adjustments will be quite a bit different. The next thing that we have up here is, and we're gonna pop back up a little bit is to go to color profile. And by default, you're usually gonna have the Adobe ones, but you can go into the preferences and change the way this shows up, whether you're using camera profile, specific ones that you load in. We're not gonna get into that because I think these are the best to use by default. So these are Adobe's. And what these are are basically presets. Think of them like that. So Adobe Color is just your general color profile. Nothing changes. If I go to Landscape, you will notice that the color saturation gets stronger. It's more saturated and it adds a little bit of contrast to the image. Portrait does the opposite. It will desaturate the image, so it, skin tones aren't like super red, and it's going to lower the contrast. Adobe Standard, I can't even tell the difference between Standard and Portrait, they're so alike. Then Adobe Vivid is what it says, it's gonna make the color saturation super strong and the contrast Super great. I'm not a huge fan of bright, vivid color, so I never use that. Basically, I use Adobe Color, 
and either portrait or standard, it doesn't really make a difference to me because they're both virtually the same. And this one, since it's a portrait, we'll leave it on portrait. All right, so the next step is what we call a global adjustment. Now, a global adjustment is when you make an adjustment, in this case, exposure, and it applies to the whole image. In a little bit, we are going to make what's called a selective adjustment. And a selective adjustment is just going to apply to a specific area. So all these adjustments that we see here are global. Well, global adjustments can be good, but you don't want to brighten up this area right here and then make this area too bright. So I don't want to go, oh, I want to brighten this up, but then now all this area is too bright. That's a global adjustment, but it's not a beneficial one. So if you do something and it makes one area look good and one area look bad, don't do it. Well, why? Because we can do it as a selective adjustment, which we will learn in a little bit. So I'm going to hit Command Z. All right, that's Control Z. That is undo and one of the most beneficial quick keys you can learn because you can make an adjustment, just hit Command or Control Z and then undo it if you don't like it, it's a lot quicker. Look, my left hand lives on that key, so I don't even really have to think about it because when I make something, I just hit Command Z and boom, it's undone. So exposure is what it says. It's brighten your entire exposure go this way, it goes dark. If we go to the right, it makes it bright. Command Z will undo it. Contrast. So contrast is making your blacks blacker and your whites whiter if you increase it, meaning going to the right. If you go to the left, it's doing the opposite. It's flattening out or lowering the contrast of blacks and whites to make them closer together. By default, I tend to actually lower the contrast of an image because in the end, when I'm in Photoshop, I can give it that pop then and there. If you start off with an image that's too contrasty and you have to take these dark areas and open them up, it's gonna require a drastic adjustment. Well, you wouldn't even need to make that adjustment if your contrast was set a little bit low because we have that detail there. You will hear me when I get into Photoshop say tone flat in the beginning. That doesn't mean that you have a flat image that you start flat, which is different. Right here, this controls your highlights. This controls your shadows, meaning it opens up your shadows, darkens your shadows. Whites, so it will make your whites whiter, make your whites grayer. Blacks, makes your blacks flatter or opens them up and go this way and it makes your blacks darker. What I'm gonna do is come up here to basic. So I've made a whole bunch of little adjustments and I could go in here and individually set these back to zero. But what I can do is hold the Alt or Option key and you'll notice that this says Reset Basic, all right? So let me see, I can click that and it will reset it back to where exactly it started from. So let's start this over again. Remember, I went to Adobe Portrait. I wanna use this as auto, and now I'm back to where I want, and I can slide these. Now, if I slide one of these, sometimes it can be difficult to get this back exactly at zero. So what you can do is hold that same Alt or Option key, and notice that this becomes reset. So I can hit reset, and it will reset that back to where it was. I can also make adjustments, and if I wanna see what they look like before, I can come up here. You will notice that there's a little eyeball, and it toggles your visibility, meaning that in the basic panel only, if I click and hold this, it can show me what it looked like before and after. Now, obviously, these adjustments were way too strong and they don't look good, so it's not something that I wanna do. I can make some smaller adjustments, and now I can see, yes, this looks a whole lot better. Once again, you can reset by using the basic up here by holding Alt or Option, or you can do Alt or Option on any one of these things that you hover and it will allow you to reset them. Obviously, I can't reset these because I haven't made an adjustment in it. Now, when I'm working in the basic panel in Adobe Camera Raw, 
The main things that I adjust are exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows. Occasionally, I will adjust the blacks. I almost never use the whites. I never use texture. I never use clarity. I never use dehaze. I never use vibrance and I never use saturation. The reason is do it in Photoshop. Why? That's when you should be doing this type of an adjustment. First of all, clarity is adding sharpening to your image. You never want to sharpen an image until the very last step, until after you've sized the image, because you must size your image to know how much sharpening you need to apply to an image. So there's no sense in doing clarity, which is adding a little bit of contrast and sharpening to your image because you want to wait to the end. All this stuff can be done in Photoshop and it will be more effective. What I'm trying to do in Adobe Camera Raw is to get my image looking better into a better state. And then I'm going to send it over into Photoshop and refine it even more. All right, so this, now you'll notice we have curves, deep, down here we have curves, detail, color mixer, color grading, and a whole bunch of other stuff available. We're gonna skip that for now, and we're gonna come back to it after we cover some of this other material. The basic panel, this is the symbol. So if you ever need to get back to the basic panel, you, those little weird sliders, that's what you wanna click on. The next one right here, is our crop tool. We have this, which is our cloning or healing brush, our masking icon, red eye reduction, snapshots, presets, and just think of this are like settings or a little menu item. What we're gonna go into next is the masking icon, all right? And before I get into the masking icon, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up some new images. So I'm gonna hit cancel over here. I'm gonna bring up some new images and we'll see you when I get the new images up. All right, so we're back. You'll notice that we have three new images. These are very specific here and they are going to translate well into the next section, which is masking. So we're gonna skip over the cropping for now. We're gonna skip over cloning and go to this little circle here that looks like a bunch of dots. And if you hover over it, you'll notice it says the quick key to get to this is the letter M. Your keyboard, meaning you would just hit M on your keyboard and this would come up. Now what I'm gonna do is come over here and just click on it. And what this is going to allow us to do is make what we call selective adjustments. It's going to allow us to select certain areas to make an adjustment in. So I'm gonna click that and a new window is gonna come up and you can see right here, we have subject, sky, and background. These are all new, meaning they just came out a month ago. And what this does is it uses artificial intelligence inside of Adobe Camera Raw to make a selection for you. The cool thing about this is, is it's usually highly accurate. So in this case, we have subject. So if I click on subject, it should be able to analyze just the subject. And you'll notice that it not only selected the guy, but it didn't select this little thing that he's stepping on, except for this little shadow area right here. And it looks like it missed this little area right here, which is not a big deal because guess what? We can refine those selections. And since I've created this selection here, what it's done is it's created a mask. You'll see this mask right up here. So the way a mask works and what I can do is I can change the overlay. Right now the overlay is in this. Let's go ahead, let's change this to black and white because it's gonna make more sense. So this is the mask. Notice the same exact up here. And what happens with the mask is anywhere there's white, when we make an adjustment over here, it's gonna apply it to this area. Anywhere there's black, it's not going to apply it. That's how it's making the selection or making the adjustment in the specific area. White, 
going to do 100% of the adjustment. Black, it's going to do none. Down here, you'll notice we've got some grays. So the way grays work, if, if this was 50% gray, it's going to do 50% of the adjustment. If this was 30% gray, that's going to do 30% of the adjustment. Now, what happens is this just didn't select this perfectly, and we can adjust this. If you remember, I said right here, it did part of the wood or shadow. We need to remove that. So this is going to be really easy for me to remove it because I can see it in this image where I need to do it. So up here, we've got an add and a subtract, meaning we want to add to the selection, which would be white, or subtract, which would be black. In this case, we want subtract. Now, how do I want to subtract? In this case, I don't want to do the subject or any of this stuff, but I want to go down here to brush because that will let me manually apply black to this mask. So I'm going to hit that and it's going to bring up a little brush. So right over here, I have the brush. I can change the size in the feather. So we will get into the feather here in a second, but I'm going to lower my feather and I'm going to lower my brush. I can change my brush size by using the scroll wheel. What I'm going to do is just paint out that bad area that I saw that I don't want the selection in. So boom, just like that, it is added to the selection. Now, if I wanted to add and make this totally white, what I can do is I can come up here to add, go to brush, that's going to give me white, and then I can paint into this area here to add. And don't worry, if you screw it up, meaning you're trying to add here and you go, oh, and you went out too far, all you got to do is hit subtract, brush, and paint it back out with black. So you can constantly paint black and white into that mask. Now, in this case, I'm going to go back to that color overlay so you can see what it looks like. So what we're trying to do is remove this area right here. And the first brush I had was the subtract, which we see here is a minus. So if I select that brush, I can come in here and I can just that area away to make sure it's accurate so I don't get it. And was there another area that I wanted to fix? I think there was, but I don't see it anymore. I think we cleaned it up when we made that selection there. So this looks pretty good. And overlay is beneficial. If you don't like the color red, you can make it blue. You can do whatever color you want to make it. It doesn't make a difference, okay? You can select the color here. If you want to remove the color overlay so you don't see it anymore, you can click the checkbox and it will go off. Or you can click the checkbox and it will go on. Or you can go over here to your settings, click those three little dots, and there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can view this. So we can do color overlay on black and white, image on black and white. I think the image is in color. This one's a little bit hard to tell. You can do image on black, image on white, white and black. All right, we're just gonna stick with color overlay because it's the simplest. Now, as soon as you come over here to make your adjustment to the image, in this case, we're gonna make a manual adjustment. As soon as I slide one of these sliders, the color overlay is going to disappear, which is a good thing because you don't wanna see the color overlay when you're making an adjustment. So if I want to lower the contrast of this guy, notice it went away, all right? If I want to increase the highlights, I can go like that. And if I don't wanna see the color overlay at all, we can go like that. So what this is allowing me to do is, is just affect that area of the image that is selected right there, all right? So that's what we call a selective adjustment. Now, selective adjustments, if I click on this again, can be made by selecting the subject, the sky, the background, objects, and people. OK, those are all the different artificial intelligence selections that can be made. So let's go ahead and click on this and let's select a different image. Let's see what sky will do. So we can come over here. We can click the masking icon, which is already selected. I can hit sky and boom, just like that. Notice it didn't select these, but it selected the sky. So now when I come in here, I'm just affecting that area. That is select sky. Now, a cool thing is, notice I selected the sky, but what if I wanna work on the opposite, meaning this area and not the sky? Well, 
what we can do is come over here to these three little dots. They're secret hidden over here and we'll click on that. And if you come down, you'll notice it will say duplicate and an invert mask, meaning it's gonna duplicate this mask, but invert it. So where there's white, it's gonna make it black. And where there's black, it's gonna make white. This is a new mask. It's not affecting the sky. This is gonna be a new mask. So here's our old mask and here's our new mask. And so now the selection is down here. So notice that now it's letting us adjust the other areas of the mask. Really cool feature. Let's come down here to this image. In this image, guess what? We don't have one person, we have two people. So if you come down, notice that it's analyzed the image and it notices that there's this woman on the left and this guy on the right. And we can select them individually. It's having a little trouble here because they're holding hands. Or we can do it together. So how does that work? Well, we can click on all people and it will select them all. I can select here and it will select just this woman. And when I do that, you'll notice that it says the entire person, meaning, oh, right now it's selected the entire person or what it thinks is the entire person. But I can refine that area to just the skin on the face. So now just her skin is adjusted, meaning what if I wanted to just brighten up the skin on her face and nothing else? or her body skin, I can add that to it and subtract the face if I wanted. I can do her eyebrows, her lips, her teeth, and her hair. All those can be individually selected in both for her and him, depending on how we make the selection. So if I decided that I wanted the entire person, I could come in here and hit create. Remember, it's just gonna make a mask for her. So I'm gonna hit create. It's gonna make that mask. Remember the way a mask works. White is the selection, black is not the selection. Remember here where we had the hands that were messed up, that would allow us to fix this if, we, if need be. So I could come in here and paint his hand out of this by hitting subtract and I'll just do this really quickly. We're gonna pick brush and I will try to paint out his hand. It's going to be hard to get into this little area without zooming in. Normally you would zoom in and make it more accurate, but you can see basically what I'm doing is making a better selection of just her and removing him. So now when I would come over here and make an adjustment, it's just affecting her in this image. Now let's hit Command Z and go back out of this because we don't want that. What if I wanna select both of them? Well, I can hit all people. Once again, I can just do their faces, their body, skin, their eyebrows, their lips, and their hair, or I can do the entire person, hit create, and when I make that selection, it's gonna brighten both of them exactly the same. That is called masking. Masking is gonna work exactly the same when you get into Photoshop and adjustment layers. Now masking is gonna be beneficial because whether you're using Lightroom, Adobe Camera Raw, or Photoshop, they all use masking. Unfortunately, the masking from Adobe Camera Raw does not, at this point, carry over into Photoshop. So you'll have to start it over once you get there. But, however, the way you select it and do it is just a little bit different. So that is using artificial intelligence to select people in your image. All right, so we have background. So in this instance, I don't wanna select the subject, but I wanna select the background. So if I come over here, I can hit backgrounds and you'll notice that it did a good job, but it selected this little thing that he's sitting on, which I didn't want. So I have two choices. One, I can not use this or I can try to paint this out. So in this case, I'm not gonna do it. Well, why? Because I can do this in Photoshop and I know I can get it done right. So let's go on over to this image and let's see if we reset everything and we say background, if it can pick out the background and it did, it did a wonderful job. 
It didn't select them. It selected the background. So now if I come in here and I adjust something, it's just selecting the background and not our subjects. So that is to select background. Now, just like before, we can add or subtract to any selection that we make if we do need to refine it. All right, so we have brought up a new image here and we're gonna take another look into masking. So I'm gonna click on that masking and you'll notice that down here we have a new set of options. One is called objects, brush, linear gradient, radial gradient, and rage gradient. What we're gonna take a look at is objects. Now what the objects are gonna do are going to select an area that in this case might not be something that artificial intelligence would be able to find. So it might be able to find the subject, which is the motorcycle because it's in focus. But what if we wanted to select the door for some reason, maybe the door was dark, maybe the door was light, we wanted to brighten or darken the door. Most likely the artificial intelligence isn't going to be able to recognize that. So what we have under objects are the ability to select other objects in two different ways. One is by using a rectangle. So I can come on over here to this rectangle and I can basically draw a rectangle around the area that I want it to select and Photoshop, boom, just like that is able to analyze it and select that object out. I also have the ability to click on object and use the, what is almost like the quick selection tool. So I'll make this bigger and it basically I can kind of come in here and paint or apply the area that I want it to see. And I'll do the best I can. And boom, just like that is able to fill in the other areas and do that. So you can use this sort of quick selection and the size has to do with the brush. And then you have the rectangle and this allows you to select specific areas. So if I wanted to get this thing here, it's probably easy just because this is rectilinear to draw a rectangle around it as close as I can, let go and boom like that. Now it's added that selection to this image, right? We've added two, it's part of this selection. So I've got this, this, and if I want to get this other one, I make a selection here, it's going to add it to that mask. Remember, white is where the adjustment's going to happen, black is not where it's going to happen. So if I now adjust this, it's gonna only specifically be in those areas. If I adjust those and then want to adjust the opposite area, remember you can always do that by coming up here to the two arrows. You can either invert a mask or in this case duplicate and invert. So it's gonna select the opposite. Now it's selected everything but those areas. So that is how to use the object selection tool. So. Let's go ahead and get out of this. All right, we have two new images up here and we're gonna start off with this image. We're gonna come over here to the masking icon and you'll notice that we have linear gradient. So gradient meaning it's gonna go from white to black or black to white. So I can click on that and I can drag this out and you will see how this is gonna work. So what I'm trying to do here is just decide the area that I want to adjust. So I want to gradate the adjustment. In this case, I want more adjustment here, less adjustment here. If you come over here, we switch this to black on white, you'll see that remember white is where the adjustment's gonna happen. And as you gradate this way, it's gonna fade it out. So how's that gonna work in this image? What's well, gonna do more here and then kind of blend it in. If we did it just straight, it would be a harsh line and you'd be able to see where it did it. Well, in this case, we want it to gradate. Usually in a sky, you gradate that adjustment. So I can come in here and I can darken that. I could increase the contrast and blend this look right here. I can turn this on and off. So we'll hold this here and you can see that's what it looked like and that's what it looks like now. Linear gradient, you can obviously reverse this and do it the opposite ways. The next option we're gonna take a look at is the radial gradient. And in this case, I don't almost ever use linear or radial gradients at all. I usually just use the brush, but we'll go ahead and use the radial gradient because I think it will work for this. 
So what I want to do is I just want to brighten up this area right in here just to make it a little bit brighter. And radial gradient works exactly like it thinks it is. You're going to make a, a radial gradient. You're going to try to make it fit the area that you want. And then it's going to do more here and less out here. So I can come in here and I can adjust this. And you can see it's changing the way that works. I can brighten that area up a little bit. That is using a radial gradient to brighten up a specific area. And you can always use multiple radial gradients. So if I wanted to do another one, I could click here, go to radial gradient. I could apply this to a new area. So if I wanted to try to do it a little bit in here, I can take this and move it. And then maybe let's say I wanted to darken this area a little bit, or I wanted to brighten this area a little bit. I can put my radial gradient in there. It's going to blend it out in that direction. Sometimes you need to blend it out on the edges to make it work. So that is using a radial gradient. And down here, the next thing that we have are range options. So if I click on this, you'll notice that there is a color range and a luminance range, meaning we can select by color range. So I could click color range and then I can come in here and I can pick a color range. So I want this kind of golden color right here. And what it's going to do, anything that has that hue, it's going to pick in that range. Now, I can refine that. If it's picking too many colors, like I just wanted this little area, I can come up here to the sample area and adjust this slider so it's more exact. Now, in this case, it's only selecting the dome, which is what I want, not these other areas. So I've used a radial gradient to select this area. And then I can come in here. In this case, let's warm it or I could cool it off to make it so it doesn't stand out. In this case, we're going to warm it up a little bit. I'm selecting by color range. The last option would be to create a new mask and select by luminance range, meaning we're going to select by brightness. So I could come in here, select this sky. And it's selecting all these bright areas. Well, I just like before, I could come in here and I can adjust the way this works. So it's just selecting a specific area. In this case, it's not doing a perfect job, but it's doing an okay job of selecting that area. Remember, I can slide these sliders right here to control how that's selecting that area. That's pretty good. I could hit add to the selection and apply more to there. But you can see it is affecting basically that area. I very rarely use luminance range and color range, but sometimes it's the best way to make a selection for a specific image. Everything in photography is very specific on the image. That's why there's so many different options or ways to almost do basically the same thing. Because in certain circumstances, luminance range is your best choice. In certain circumstances, color range is your best choice. So those are all the different ways to use the masking or selection tools to make selections inside of Adobe Camera Raw. So what we're gonna do here is, I think it is best if you play around with what you've learned so far and learn how to use this. If I tell you everything in one giant long video, you'll get too much information and it will be extremely difficult for you to process it. You'll start to forget more than you remember. How do I know this? Because I teach students and I see that happening in them. So take what you've learned, do your global adjustments, your basic adjustments and your selective adjustments, learn how to do it. Then watch the second part of this video and in the second part of this video, we'll click on this image here, we'll start to go over the crop tool, the clone tool, all the other stuff, and what this stuff means here. In general, these are less important, except for maybe the color mixer, than everything you've learned. 95% of what you're gonna be doing are your selective adjustments and your global adjustments and your white balance in Adobe Camera Roll. But I will show you how to do everything in the next video of Adobe Camera Raw. And don't forget, if you found this video helpful, it would be greatly appreciated if you could give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe.